Um, and on, on such a special day, of course, Father's Day. Um, it's great to have Jerry with us today. It might be the last time that, that Jerry is able to join with us. As, as some of you know, she's uh, due to deploy soon over to the Middle East um, with her work with the Army. So, um, yeah, it's great to have Jerry with us. And also our all pair Winnie with us today as well. It's joining us here for the second time. So it's great to have you here too, Winnie. Well, today I wanted to start with, with a reading. Um, and it's probably a very well-known reading. In fact, I'd say that just about every Christian in the world over probably knows this passage. It's Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13. I'm reading from the King James Version. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now the Lord's Prayer is an elegant and inspiring piece of literature. I'd probably say it's probably the second best known piece of literature apart from John 3.16 in the entire Bible. <coughs> but such elegance and inspiration is sometimes lost on the young. The following are some reinterpretations of the prayer by children. I'm pretty sure from the quotes are from the United States. One little girl began her prayer like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hello, what be thy name? Another five-year-old girl played, give us this day our daily bread and liberty and justice for all. A kindergartner asked God to give us this day our jelly bread. Mm -hmm. And there was one little boy who prayed, forgive us our dentists as we <laughs> forgive our dentists. <laughs> and one child climaxed his prayer like this, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen and FM. <laughs> But one of my favourites was the young boy who prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, how do you know my name? <laughs> and as I began to think about what sermon to preach, I kept coming back to this idea though of God as our Father. Now, as I often do, a little background study for the sermon, I decided to have a look how many times God was called Father in Scripture. And I discovered that there's over 1,000 verses that use the word Father. And of those, a little over one third referred to God as Father. And what struck me as unusual was that in the Old Testament you could count on both hands where God was called Father. But by contrast, in the New Testament there was between 200 and 300 verses that called him that. Now a few of those come to mind easily. In the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, it speaks of the prodigal's father who celebrated his son's return. And it's obvious that the Father Jesus spoke of in that parable was, of course, our Heavenly Father. In Matthew 28, verse 9, it speaks of baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, verse 2, it says, My Father's house has many rooms. And in John 14, verse 6, it says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the words of Jesus himself recorded in Matthew 6, verse 9, of course, we just heard them, Our Father who art in heaven. So the first question that comes to mind is this. How come there are so many more verses in the New <coughs> Testament than in the Old Testament calling God our Father? Well, I'm not quite sure, but we're not told, but this much I'm certain of in the New Testament, it's obvious that you can't have God as your Father or be in the type of relationship with Him unless we truly make the decision to be a Christian. Now Galatians 4 verse 6, for example, tells us, it says, Because you are His sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. See, it's the Spirit's presence in our lives that gives us the desire and the privilege of calling God our Father. Now some scholars have noted Abba is a very intimate and personal term. It's kind of like a child calling their father Daddy. 
In, back in the 1980s, there were some believers that began to refer to God as Daddy. It was sort of a movement that didn't really quite take. But the point of it was, there was no mistake in the fact that Abba was meant to help us see God as someone who desired to have an intimate and personal relationship with him. He was communicating that he was not some interpersonal, otherworldly being. He was not an uncaring and distant deity. He wanted us to see him as our Heavenly Father. He wanted us to understand that because of that, he was there to protect and guard us and supply for our needs. He is our Father. Now one person said, God loves fathers because he is one. And that's cool. But that truth also points to a powerful reality that implies that God is the model of what it means to be a good dad. Do you realize that? See, God being a heavenly father models what an earthly father should be like. What he could be like and what he would be like by the power and guidance of Jesus in their lives. So let's take a look at the Lord's Prayer one piece at a time and see what it says about fatherhood. The first is, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? See, there are theologians who spend decades trying to make terms like that even more complicated to understand than they already are. But the meaning of hallowed isn't really all that complicated. There are other words that also help to extrapolate what it means, but essentially hallowed means holy, and it also means to be set apart from the common. So to be hallowed means that God is set apart. He is unique, of special importance. And the same holds true for earthly fathers. God designed earthly fathers to be unique, special and important. Now this isn't how our present day culture portrays fathers. <coughs> if you watch many sitcoms, how many people watch sitcoms these days? Yeah, a few of us. Have a look at your Phil Dunphys and your Al Bundys if I go back to married with children. Anybody remember Al Bundy? Yeah. I'd rather forget him. Yeah, you'd rather forget him, yeah. See, they're seen as dads that are incompetent and clueless. They are an embarrassment to their children, a burden to their wives, who are needed more as mothers than spouses, and useless at the workplace. Certainly true of Al Bundy. And even numerous children shows of the past two generations go out of their way to depict dads as inept and without redeeming values. How many of you are familiar with Homer Simpson? Now a wise father though understands that, but refuses to live down to those expectations. He realises how special his role as a strong father in the family is. And according to numerous studies, the presence of a strong and loving father increases the IQ of his children. Secondly, they help their daughters learn to have a proper trust, intimacy with men. And their daughters learn to appreciate their own femin femininity and they learn that they are love worthy. A fa three, a father who is involved with his children teaches them about competition, challenge, innovative, risk-taking, and independence. Thus, by identifying with earthly fathers, God is declaring that fathers should be held in respect. They should be honoured when they try, however imperfectly, to be there for their kids. Secondly, thy kingdom come, God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what's that mean? It means that God is in charge. He is responsible for what takes place in his family, in his church, in the kingdom. And his decisions are the foundation of our relationship with him. In the same way, earthly dads are responsible for what takes place in their household. Earthly fathers keep order in the home and set the moral compass for the family. A great example of this is what happens in families in just about every home. 
where siblings get into arguments over who gets their way. Haven't we all seen this take place in families? And the fighting somehow becomes even more harsh when the kids are in a room all by themselves, doesn't it? However, the fighting almost always stops when a certain someone enters the room. Did you know that? You know who that someone is? It's when dad comes in. Once dad comes in the room, the arguing stops. And if it doesn't, dad makes sure it stops. It's in the same way that we often can tell you when our heavenly father isn't in the room. There's lots of arguing and lots of concerns when we don't get our way. Because that's the effect that earthly fathers have in their households. It's a universal truth. Earthly fathers have influence in the family. They control the arguing and the fighting. And they're there to keep order and keep the family under control. Literally, their will is done. Now thirdly, give us this day our daily bread. See, earthly fathers are responsible for keeping food on the table and roofs over the heads of their families. Now dads may not be the only wage earner in the home, but it's their job to make sure that the needs of the family are taken care of. So God expressed this truth when he confronted Adam about his sin, right back in Genesis. In Genesis 3, verses 17 to 18, quotes God saying to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. See, dads understand that it is their primary role to supply for the family. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explained this truth. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? In Matthew 7, verses 9 to 11. Then we move on to the passage, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now this is where things can get tough for dads. There are times when kids can be really frustrated, can't they? Yeah. I'm looking at John Wicks, just thinking like, yep, yeah, he probably knows that well. Thank you, John. And the temptations for fathers is to start saying and believing, this is who my kid is. They're lazy, selfish, messy, argumentative, give up too easily are deceptive, and on and on and on. And that's often exactly how children are. And that's exactly how they have been for centuries. Mark Twain once said this, When a child turns 12, he should be kept in a barrel and fed through a hole until he reaches 16, at which time you should plug the hole. It's pretty harsh, isn't it? But kids can be annoying. They can be. And when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father, guess what? We can become very annoying as well. Our Heavenly Father forgives us over and over and over and over and over. Wait for it. And over again. And you've got to believe that that's got to get really annoying for God, doesn't it? But if he gives us anyway, do you know why? Because he believes in us. He looks beyond our sinfulness to what we can be. He may punish us for our sins, but he repeatedly forgives us and works with us to help us get beyond our failures. A person by the name of Grady Nutt used to tell the story of a family that invited a new preacher and his wife for Sunday dinner. Now, the woman was uptight, hoping that everything would go smoothly with the meal she had prepared. And they had coached the kids on being on their best behaviour. But just after the prayer for the food, their seven-year-old daughter accidentally spilled her tea all over the beautiful tablecloth. The girl was terrified 
and the mother tried to hide her frustration. Before the mother could do anything, the father sized up the situation and spilled his tea and started laughing. Slowly the preacher, his wife and finally the mother followed suit and did the same amidst the laughter. The girl looked up at her father knowing that he had saved her from an embarrassing moment. He winked at her and she smiled and went back at him as a tear slid down her face. God is like that with us. He forgives us and works to help us get beyond our failures. And that is the way godly earthly fathers should treat their children. They should believe in their children and what they can do in their lives for God. Now fifth is lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Now this has always been quite puzzling to me that Jesus would say that we should ask our Heavenly Fathers to lead us not into temptation. Do you know what that means? Neither do I really. So I'm not going to go into it too much this morning. Instead though, I want us to view this from the perspective that Jesus is comparing our Heavenly Father to our earthly fathers. The earthly fathers don't always do the right things, do they? They can curse. They can act immaturely. They can be unfair. They can blow up and lose their temper. And they can misunderstand, misuse or hurt their kids. By their actions, they teach their children and their actions lead their kids into the temptation to act like they do. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament about the great, 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 great grandson of Cain, a man by the name of Lamech. Anyone know him? See, Cain, of course, killed his brother Abel and God cursed him. But God promised Cain if anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over in Genesis 4 verse 15. A few hundred years later, Lemek bragged about Cain's punishment by saying, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lemek 77 times, in Genesis 4, verse 24. In effect, Cain's sin and punishment became a point of honour for Lemek's own wickedness. Cain had taught him how to, be, how to behave in his evil. The one person once noted children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. Now why on earth do dads do stupid stuff? Why do they curse and behave badly to their families? Well, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Dads do, mums do, and kids do. So as dads, we need to consciously decide to deliver our kids from evil, but how do we do that? Well, that brings us to our last point. The thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forevermore. Amen. Whose kingdom is it? God's. Whose power? God's. Whose glory? God's. A godly father realises none of what he has belongs to him. His family, his wife and his children all belong to God. It is not his kingdom, it's God's. He doesn't have the power in the home, God does. And any glory and honour he gets as a father is all because God gave it to him. Thus when a dad fails, curses, loses his temper, behaves badly, he should realise how important his role is in teaching his son and daughter what is to follow, what it is to follow God. And how does he do that? Well, firstly, he does that by admitting he was wrong, by confessing his favour, by asking forgiveness, and by determining to do better next time. So we live in a world where men have trouble doing that. The world wants to make men appear incompetent and unworthy. And fathers often try and compensate by trying to appear to be always right and unbendingly in control. But God says that godly fathers need to realise their failings and shortcomings 
and teach their children humility by their willingness to confess their sins. Let me tell you, just before I draw to a close here, a poem written by Andrew Gillies. It says, Last night my little boy confessed to me some child is wrong, and kneeling at my knee he prayed with tears. Dear God, make me a man like Daddy, wise and strong. I know you can. Then while he slept, I knelt beside his bed, confessed my sins and prayed with low bowed head. O oh God, make me a child like my child here, pure, guileless, trusting me with faith and sin. I want to close this morning by simply saying this. Today is a day that we honour fathers for the unique and special role and responsibility that God has called them to do. I pray that you have a father that you cherish and respect that has played a special and loving role in your lives and that you are truly thankful for. But if you're here this morning and perhaps didn't have that relationship with your earthly father because of circumstance or even there or your father, I pray that today you will take comfort from the fact that you have a heavenly Father that loves you and that cares for you, that has no failing, and is a perfect Father who is always there for you and me. God bless. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers.